Well, welcome to our church. Thank you for making the time to uh, be with us today and to make this place and these people the, the location and the group in which you want to encounter Jesus in a personal way today. We are in this series that we started last week called Questions and Doubts. And uh, in case you missed it last week, uh, Pastor Gillian spoke on God and the mind. And one of the things that we're doing in this series is that at the beginning of the year, you gave us your questions. Questions of things, of issues, of, uh, of uh, topics that normally we don't talk about in church. So we gathered them all and we divided them in, 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 in groups, in clusters, and in, in topics. And, and one of the questions that came up was about all the different churches that exist. How do we know which one is the right one? How do we know which one is according to the Bible? How do we know that we're in the right faith? So let's do a little bit of uh, background on what churches in America are like and in the world, actually. This is the world population. And as you can see, only 31% of the world is Christian. Now, perhaps part of the question about why are there so many churches also included non-Christian churches like Buddhist or, or uh, Hindus or all kinds of other denominations. Now, because the world church, the word church, the word church only appears in the book of Acts, the word ecclesia or church belongs specifically to Christian denominations. Are you with me? So when we talk about churches, because it comes from the Bible, from the Jewish scriptures, from the New Testament, actually, from the book of Acts, the word ecclesia means, is when we get the word church. If you speak Spanish, it sounds like the word iglesia, which means church. So the word church belongs to Christian denominations. Now, so when we talk about Christian denominations, we found out something very, very interesting. Catholics are the largest group, and they had about 1,200 million members. Now, let me remind you, uh, I'm coming from a Catholic background, and being a Catholic member is very, 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 very easy. All you have to do is being born. So that, that kind of helps. And you can see all the different churches uh, with their membership. And SDA, Seventh-day Adventist Church, has 25 million members around the world. Now, what makes a church and not a cult? Let's start right there. A church, it's a group of believers in a structure, church, organized in leadership, worldwide, with a school system and a hospital system. So any other group that does not share those characteristics most likely will be a cult. So putting that out, out of the way, let's go to the question. Why are there so many Christian churches? Now our job here is not to talk about every single church because we will need to spend a few months talking about this. Our job here is, no, is not to criticize other beliefs or their practices. Our job and task here is to present what the Bible teaches about what is the true church that Jesus established when he came to earth. And to do that, the only way that we can do it is going through the scripture. So I'd like to I invite you to open your Bibles or get your notes that you receive in the bulletin. And let's go to Revelation. The book of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. This chapter of Revelation, we spoke about this actually last year in the series uh, about uh, loved. It was the seven letters to the churches. Remember that? The last mes message on that series, we spoke and we went in detail from every single text, and we explain the meaning uh, uh, of that uh, chapter. So today, we're not going to do that, but we're going to explore the, uh, 
identifications of the church that Jesus wants on this earth out of this text. Are you ready? Okay, two people are. Awesome. Revelation 12, verse 1. And he reads, now a great sign appear in heaven. Let's stop right there for a second. Did you read great sign? If it says sign, which is a, the original, sign means that it is, it is a symbol. Are you with me? It's not a literal woman that appeared in heaven. It is a symbol. Now, so now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and her head a garland of 12 stars. Now, like we said before, this woman is a symbol. The question is, a symbol of what? We understand that every time that Jesus makes a reference between him and his faithful people, he uses the image of him being a groom and his people being a bride. We see that through the scriptures. We see that in the parable of the, of the 12 virgins. We see that from Jesus saying, I am the groom. The church is the bride. Right? Now, where this idea is coming from. In the book of Songs of Solomon, you remember this book. I'm pretty sure you remember. Because this book is about a relationship between a man and a woman. The language that is used in the book of Solomon, in the book of Songs, um, to describe the bride is this. Who is she who looks for as the morning? What is the woman in Revelation dressed like? The sun. When does the sun come up? In the morning. Fair as the moon. Where is she standing on? The moon. Clear as the sun, awesome as an army with banners. So this is an amazing woman. Can you imagine, husbands, your wife coming home with a bunch of banners and saying, hey, I'm here, honey. Right? This is what Solomon is saying. My bride is just as awesome. The description that we find in Revelation is not the description of a bride on earth on the wedding day. It's a description of the faithful people of God. So this woman represents the faithful people of God through the ages. Now, verse 3, Revelation 12. And another sign appear in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Now, red dragon. When we hear the word dragon, we don't have to go a lot into the scriptures because we know what that means. The dragon is who? Satan is the enemy. So in this chapter, it is presented before us the two entities that will be in conflict. The faithful people of God and Satan. By the way, the word Satan in Hebrew means the enemy, the adversary. So that's exactly who he is. Verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now there's a new character. And this character is who? Michael. Now, Michael is what we call a compound word. Every time we read in the scripture, someone in, that in their name appears the word El, E-L, means God. Daniel, Daniel, God is my judge. So every time that we see E-L together means God. Now, that's half of the word. The second half of the word is a preposition. Mick. Can you say Mick? Not too difficult, right? Mick means like. So Michael is he who is like God. Jesus was asked, show us the Father. And Jesus responded, 
If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because Jesus is like God. He is Mikael. He is Michael. Now, so Michael and his angels fought. Now, this is not a war like we could imagine portrayed in the movies. This is not a war where Michael had his, or, or Jesus had his sword and was cutting away bad angels. No. No. This is a battle of, a, of choice. A, a war that it, the battlefield is the minds of every single creature in heaven. At the end of this war, Michael won. But like in any war, there were casualties. A third of the angels of heaven chose to follow Satan. But there was no place left for them in heaven. Now, the question is, when did the battle take place? I hear some ideas that, that the battle took place before creation. I hear some others that the battle took place after creation. And Harry's just confused. <laughs> now, when we read the scripture, and when we read what we call the spirit of prophecy, there's a book that is entitled Desire of Ages. And the book Desire of Ages talks about in detail what happened the day that Jesus died on the cross. And one of the most important items, pieces of information that appear in that chapter is that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the true intentions of Satan were shown. His true character. Now, let me tell you something. Up to the moment of the cross, there were angels in heaven of those two-thirds that had not made their choice, still kind of like in the fringes, kind of like confused, kind of like you and me at times. But it wasn't until the moment when Jesus was hanging on the cross that they actually realized the true intentions of the heart of Satan. And that's when they decided that there was no more place for Lucifer in heaven. So he was completely spelled because everyone had already made their choice. Are you with me now? Verse 13, Revelation 12. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. And uh, you can go back to the series, to the other series, when we talk about in detail about this. But there, now we see the emphasis of the dragon. What is the dragon doing? Persecuting. Let me, let me see if you guys got it now. What is the dragon doing? Persecuting. Persecuting. He's chasing the woman and anything related to her. Verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should be fed of the, where, she, where she should be fed there 1,260 days. So, let's picture what's happening here. The woman is a faithful people of God. Satan has no place in heaven. Because he can attack the heavenly creatures anymore. He goes to attack the earthly creatures. God's creation. So when he comes down... The faithful people of God are represented, represented by this woman. And Satan comes and attacks the woman. But God says, wait a minute. These are my faithful children. I have a place for her. And you will attack them, but not forever. In fact, there's a limit. Now, when Jesus came to earth, he established, established a church. That was the Christian church. In the book of Acts, it's called the way. Because Jesus was the truth, the way, and the light. 
So now, Jesus established a church. A church that was pure, that was imperfect, but it was faithful. And it was very simple. In this they will know you are my children when you love one another. The sign of discipleship that Jesus established was that the people had to love one another. But what happened with the years after Jesus left was that the Christian people took love away from the equation. And judgment took place of love. So now to justify that sin took place of love, they said, okay, but there's something that you can do. You have to pay for your sin. How was love taken away? Because the greatest act of love that was Jesus dying on the cross was taken away as the redemption, redemption for sin and now our own works took place. Because now there's something that you could do to change your sinful state. And that's when the problems began. Because these kinds of ideas was what the devil used to persecute his people, the people of God. Now, so we come to the first issue. And it's the issue of origin. Jesus started one church, but was man who messed it up. So how do we know when we are in the right church? Because this church has to start after this period of persecution. Are you with me? The persecution is for those or against those who are faithful to the teachings of Jesus. Those who were not faithful to the teachings of Jesus were not persecuted. So to be the faithful people of God, that had to be persecuted. So the survivors of this persecution were, or are, <laughs> the faithful people of God. Does that work? Okay. So as you can see, the persecution began in the year 538. And we could spend hours talking about these dates, but all we need to know is about the persecution taking place. And it ended in 1798. In 1798, that Christian church that began to say that you could forgive, you get the forgiveness of your own sins by your, your own actions and by the way, your own money too. Because you could pay indulgences to forgive your sin. Suffered. In fact, lost this political power. Not only was a Christian, a, a, a spiritual power, but also became a political power. In fact, he got to the point that if the church did not appoint the king, the king was not for reals. So it is in 1798 that this persecution ends and begins a movement called the Great Awakening. Great Awakening was a movement of people all over the world who began to study the scriptures. Obviously, this is after the Reformation. And these people began to study the scriptures and discovered not just justification by faith, that we are forgiven by the grace of God, not by our own doings, but also they discovered that Jesus was coming back, that our destiny was not dictated when we died and we went directly to the place either to heaven or, or hell but actually our destination was going to be when Jesus would come back. So this great awakening began to be preached all over the world. So the faithful people of God, this movement grows after the great persecution. So we could say safely that every church that began before the end of the great persecution is not the faithful people of God. 
I'm not saying that they're evil people. I'm not saying that they're bad people. I'm not saying that they cannot be redeemed. I'm not. What I'm saying is that they're missing a little bit of the truth that they didn't get to if they remain in their original teachings. Now, we come to the second issue. Verse 15. So now it's the woman on earth. The devil is being cast from heaven and he is on earth because he's attacking the woman and he says, so the serpent is spewed water out of his mouth. Where is the water coming out of? The mouth of the dragon, right? Now, this is very interesting because every time that we talk about water in, in, in uh, prophetic writings, water means ideas, means human ideas. So it is during this time, during the great, great awakening also, that ideas like evolution, you know when Origin of a Species was written? 1844. Does that sound familiar? 1844. Now, by the way, you don't want to miss next week. Next week, we'll talk about science and the Bible. You do not want to miss that one. Okay? Now that I plugged in my commercial. It says, uh, the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. Now, that he may, might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Verse 16. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened his mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of the mouth. So these ideas that the, woman is that the serpent is thrown against the woman, the earth, the earth itself shows the evidences how those ideas were wrong. And we'll talk about that next week. Now, the second issue. The issue of practice. The issue of practice. Because the remnant, the faithful people of God, love to keep the commandments. Verse 17. You have it right there in your notes. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war... Because during the persecution, she couldn't defeat it. God protected her, had it nourished and, and, and cared for. So now the devil goes not against the woman, but against the rest of her offspring. Those who survive the persecution. Those who arise after this great persecution. Notice that it says, to make war with the rest of her offspring. You see that? He doesn't say with her offspring, but with the rest. How can I explain this to you? Have you ever drunk horchata? This, this Hispanic rice water, rice beverage. When you have one, one of those glasses with horchata, and you drink it, you discover something. That towards the bottom of your glass, there's residue, sediments. If you ever tasted them, that's where all the sweetness is. That's where all the flavor is coming from. The water itself takes its flavor from that remnant. Are you with me? The rest of the offspring is the remnant. Is what gives it its flavor. Is where the consistency is. Why? Well, it says right here, who keep the commandments of God. This means commandment number one, number two, number three, you guessed it, number four, Children, numbers 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. They keep the totality of the commandments of God. How do we know that's what Jesus likes? John 14, 15 is right there in your notes. 
if you love me, this is Jesus talking by the way. If you're using a Bible with red letters, it's red. If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus didn't say some of my commandments. Jesus didn't say the ones you like. Like Chipotle, when you go and you ask whatever you know. <laughs> Keep my commandments. So we could safely say that any church that does not keep one of the commandments is not part of the remnant. Are you with me? Now, why is this issue of the commandments so important to God? The commandments were not made so that we could be tested. No. The commandments were designed for us to be protected. Let me explain it to you like this. Have you ever built a fence? Okay. Do you have a fence? Okay. You'll discover right away that fences, all the fences have something in common. And that commonality among fences appears every so many feet in distance. Because what keeps the fence standing is not the gate, are the posts that every so many feet hold the fence up. Every commandment that God has given us is a post in the fence of protection around us. Amen. And see, this is what happens. I'm in, in, in the middle of my fence, and this is what I say. Well, today, I don't feel like keeping the third. And because I don't feel like keeping the third... The fourth is going to suffer. So that day, pose number three will come down. Most of my fence is still standing. But the devil has access to me now. Because I tore down one of the poles. One of the poles that's holding my fence up. Are you with me? So the more commandments that I break, I'm not... Attacking God. I'm attacking myself. And because God loves me so much, I am the reason why he gave his life. He wants me protected. You see, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 40, he says, You shall therefore keep his statutes. This is Moses talking to the people. And his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you. Let's read that again. That if you keep the commandments, it would go well with you. And your children after you. And that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God has given you for all time. What were the commandments given to us? So that it will go well with our family and with our life. That is why Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Because it's a relationship. It is a relationship. See, imagine that a couple gets married. And on that ceremony, you know, it's beautiful. The place is just gorgeous, gorgeously uh, arranged and the flowers and the colors and the tool and everything is nice. And the couple say, I do. And the minister says, you may kiss the bride. And everybody claps. They get home. And the husband says, honey, I said I do. So I'm done. Exactly. That's what she would say. What? What are you talking about? Because when we say I do in our wedding vows, 
It is intended not to be an occasional thing. It is intended to be a continuous process in which husbands and wives have promised to love and do whatever he needs for the relationship to continue on and on and on, regardless of the circumstances. That is exactly what Jesus is saying. I did all this for you, and I have this prepared for you. If you love me, you're going to be in that relationship with me. And as long as you're in that fence of protection, a relationship is going to be protected. But when you allow someone else to come in the relationship, we have a problem. So, we got the issue of the commandments, the issue of practice. And now we have another issue that identifies the true church, and this is the issue of faith. And that is that this remnant, this faithful people of God, this true church, uphold the testimony of Jesus. Now, what does that mean? Let's go back to our notes. Revelation 12, 17. Not only they keep the commandments, but it says in the middle of the text, and have the testimony of Jesus. Testimony in our time, in our culture, is defined as that action of having witnessed an event and being able to tell what the event was about. We have people who go to court to testify because they experienced that. They were there. They observed it. They heard it. They know about it. Or they're experts on that matter. And because they have the knowledge, they can tell about it. And that is called a testimony. The testimony of Jesus for us as the church is that experience that we've had with him and what we can tell about him in our lives. And some of you look confused. Revelation 19.10 says, this is John, the revelator. He, he's, he has his, his vision, and in his vision, he is in front of an angel. And John sees the angel, and you know, when you see an angel, the first thing you do is, you're afraid. And don't take my word for it, every single person in the Bible who saw an angel were afraid. So he fell, he says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. But it's an angel, Right? Do we worship angels? No. So the angel says to me, see that you do not do that. Don't worship me. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. So there's other John like you who have an experience, a personal experience with Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. At this moment, I know that some of you are thinking exactly what to say. What the testimony of Jesus is. Spirit of prophecy. But let's continue. Verse 22. I mean chapter 22, verse 8 and 9. Same situation. Look at this. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. It's like he didn't get it the first time. <laughs> and show me these things. Verse 9. Then he said to me, see that you don't do that. You see that? Yeah. See that you don't do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets. It's exactly the same thing, but different words. You see it? And those who keep the words of this book. So worship God. So John, in two different occasions, experienced the same thing. And the angel tells him exactly the same thing. So the first time he tells him the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The second time he tells them the testimony of Jesus is the words of the prophets. Let me show you something. Today is show and tell. I have with me two things. The first thing that I want to show you is my Old Testament. And my Old Testament is in Hebrew. This Old Testament... 
It's a little bit different than yours. Because yours is divided or organized from Genesis to Malachi. Mine is a little bit different. Genesis to Deuteronomy, it's called the Torah. And my Old Testament says Torah. That is the first section. So in that order, we're okay. But then it changes. Because mine says Nabi'im. And Nabi'im is a plural of Naba. And Naba is a prophet. So after the Torah, in my Old Testament in Hebrew, is a section of the prophets. So all the prophets follow the Torah. The angel is talking to John about this. The prophets. Any Jew knew that when he, the reference to the prophets was made, this is what they were talking about. The prophets. And he has a third part. Ketubim. And Ketubim means the writings. So songs of Solomon, the Proverbs, the Psalms. All these books appear in the Ketubim and the writings. But this is very interesting. Because you know how we like to shorten things, right? When we say something, we, we cut it short. The Jews did the same thing. So every time they said the Torah, they meant the Scriptures. Every time they said the prophets, they meant the Scriptures. Because at the end of the day, who wrote the Torah? A prophet. So every time they mentioned the prophets, they were talking about the Scriptures. So what J Angel is telling John is, John, the spirit of prophecy... Is the scriptures. Are you with me? Now. Before I show you the second one. I want you to read. John 5.39. It's right there in your notes. You search the scriptures. This is Jesus talking to the, to, to the Pharisees. You search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And these. What is these? The scriptures. Are they which testify of me? So Jesus is saying, the scriptures are my testimony. The testimony of Jesus is the scriptures. Are you with me? Okay. Now let me confuse you a little more. I have this book here with me. It's titled Testimonies for the Church. And it's written by one woman, Ellen White. I've read this book a few times and others. We have a problem that we need to correct. Because we have called her the what? The spirit of prophecy. She is not the spirit of prophecy. She has the spirit of prophecy. She experienced the spirit of prophecy. She wrote, but even she said, my writings are not the scriptures. My writings are a lesser light that points to the greater light. In fact, she writes in the book, uh, The Great Controversy, that God at the end will rise up people that will use the scripture and the scripture alone. Are you with me? Yes. So the question is this. There's only two sources of inspiration that she could have been inspired by. Either the devil or God. So I asked, who could have inspired those scenes on the cross in the Desire of Ages? Who could have inspired all those counsels for parents, for teachers, for, for doctors, for people. At, in the home, at work, in the church. 
I think that those cancels were inspired by God. She is not the spirit of prophecy, but she experienced a relationship with Jesus that allowed her to obtain the wisdom needed at the time to teach the church what the church needed to hear. Are you with me? I'm not taking her value away. I'm putting it in the right place. So when we talk about the testimony of Jesus as being the spirit of prophecy, it's not only her writings. It's the Bible, complete Bible. So those churches who don't follow the whole Bible, because there are churches that only believe in the New Testament. Now you know where I'm going. So those churches that do not take the Bible in its entirety are not the remnant church of God. And we come to the last issue. And it's the issue of salvation. The faithful people of God are saved only. Let me say that again. Are saved only by the blood of the Lamb. Verse 12. Revelation, uh, verse 11. Revelation 12. And they, referring to, the, to this remnant people, to the, to the rest of the offspring, and they will overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. I don't think it can be any clearer than this. And by the word of their testimony, their experience with Jesus. And they did not love their lives to death. Now, this is not a new, this is not a new idea. This is an idea that appears in the Old Testament. This is an idea that appeared before the, before the people of Israel became the people of God as a nation. They were slaves in Egypt. And the day, basically the day of their independence, their 4th of July, Moses speaks to them. Exodus 12, it's rather in your notes. Verse 12. Moses had told them that they needed to kill a lamb. And from his blood, they would need it to paint. They would need it to paint the doorpost on the doors. And he tells them why. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13. Now the blood, it says shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. The blood shall be a sign for you in the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over. Now you know why we call it Passover. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And family, this is an, the amazing part of this. That this same advice applies to us today. Because it is the blood of the Lamb that will protect us on the day of judgment. As faithful people of God, we should not worry about the day of judgment. We should not worry about the tribulation. We should not worry about the persecution. We should worry about is the blood of the Lamb in my house. Is the blood of the Lamb in my heart. Because what matters at the end of the day is where is the blood of the Lamb. Since we're on that topic, Ellen G. White writes this letter in 1905. And it says, Receive Him with all your heart and know that He wants you to win the crown of life. Let this be your greatest and most earnest request. Make an entire surrender and he will cleanse you from every pollution. And make your vessels unto honor. You, pay attention to this part, you may be washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Thus, you will gain the victory. So the only possible way that we can gain the victory is when we're dipped in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. There is nothing I can do for God to love me more and there is nothing I can do for God to love me less. 
There is nothing I can do to earn my salvation because Jesus already did it all. Amen. What I have to do is to have an experience with him. And that will be my testimony. My experience with the Lamb. My experience with the Savior. My experience who is willing to give it all so that I can have it all. The true church is not a denomination. The true church is not a name on a door. The true church is all those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Let us pray that we become that people. That people that remains standing when Jesus comes.